Welcome to the Anti-Architect Podcast. I am your host, Christian Giordano. As president and owner of the design firm Mancini Duffy, I am driven by a quest for learning and radically changing the industry. With this podcast, I'm hoping to improve the industry that I'm so passionate about by taking a critical look at how architects work through a variety of voices and shared experiences. Hello, Anti-Architect Podcast listeners. I'm excited to have Jack Osa, AIA Lead AP, as my guest here on the Anti-Architect Podcast. Jack is an architect, brand designer, strategist, and musician. He is the founder of Osa Studio, based in North Carolina. He is also the host of a very successful podcast, The Power of Design Podcast, where he was gracious enough to have me as a guest on episode 45. You can check that out. Jack is driven to improve people's life experience by applying design principles to become a better version of themselves while growing their teams, their businesses, and their profits. With his architecture degree, Jack migrated from Columbia, South America, to Charlotte in 2001. His story is very much that of the American dream. From washing windows, to busboy, to learning English, to now owning his own architecture firm. Honestly, it gives me the, the chills just thinking about it. Loaded with dreams, drive, and determination, Jack embarked on a journey of self-improvement, learning, and hard work while becoming a skilled technical architect and design strategist. His mission in life is to empower people to pursue their full potential through the power of design and use his entrepreneurship as a platform to explore the intersection of business, creativity, culture, and diversity to become a catalyst for positive transformation. I was connected to Jack through the podcast world, and I just love his story. Jack, I'm super excited to have you here. Uh, Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for uh, for agreeing to be here on the on the podcast. So, um, Jack's a pro, which is great because uh, you know makes it easier here for uh i'm a newbie in the podcast world jack's been doing this longer than me he's got like triple the amount of episodes so you know that that'll this is fun for me i'm still a baby uh, you, baby. you can teach me so let, let's jump right into it um if, if you had to pick one thing that annoys you about architects uh, what might that be that they believe they own the project is not their project because you're not paying for it when you pay for it, that's your project, but they take ownership of something that is not theirs. And, and I think that's a big problem. And, and I understand that we're very passionate about what we do and taking ownership. It's part of that. But I think understanding the limitation of that ownership, it's, it's key to really be a good architect to understand what the, what the project is in the, in our clients context. So, yeah, I, I like that answer. So that, that's yeah. different from some of the others that I've gotten. So I, I they, it gives me a thought. I remember we were with a client and um, we had a senior designer who um, the, the, the client was saying, well, I, I would like to see that it was, I remember specifically, it was a crown on a building way up, you know, probably 16 stories up in a, in a, in a, a building in New York City. And the, the client said, I, I really don't, I really would like to see, you know, this crown on, on the top of the building. And the senior designer on the job said, I will not allow that on my building. And the client <laughs> said, well, too bad. Because yeah. It's my building. I own it and I'm paying right. for it. So we're putting it on there. And I remember That's we right. had to take him off the job after that because it didn't it didn't go well <laughs> after that. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. That's funny. Um so architects think of of architecture in many different ways, right? How, you know, and, and it can be personal. What you know, what does architecture mean to you? Uh it had about two or three points of view that I always like to use. So I think one, just by by nature, architecture to me is empty space, you know, is void. So, you know, we, we're these you, you humans in, in this planet and there is all this emptiness around us, right? So we need to um, 
we need to start giving definition to this void, right? And, and we need to give a definition so the spaces can serve a specific function. So we start creating architecture by defining that empty space with, um, you know, walls, roof, ceilings, and we start giving uh, characteristics to that space. So um, to me, the, the basic notion of architecture is a human per perception of space. So when we're designing um, architecture, we're design designing something we cannot see, we can only experience. And the walls, the textures, all the characteristics that are visual and material of architecture, they just a way to give definition to the space and to define that perception. I think one of the biggest differences I have with other people or other architects is that they think that architecture is the solid material. Mm. That, is just, that is just the tool to define the empty space. That's one thing. The other thing is what architect, what the role of the architect is in society. And I think based on, on my first answer, it's about how are we serving our clients to be a tool to help them achieve their goals. So understanding that we we can add value on in the way we help our clients spend money in a very responsible way, right? Sure. We make sure they're putting the money where, where it should be, make sure that the building is is meeting their needs, make sure that the business is responding to to their requirements. And then once once that level is set there is all this added value that we, we can bring to it, right? And so we can understand how do we make this experience even more functional than what they thought it could be? How, we, how do we make it even more special, even mm -hmm. more beautiful? So we start creating um, something that the client did not expect they were going to get. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. I like that architecture as void. You're right, because <clears throat> when you think about it, you do, even in architecture school, you start with sort of a solid, with a mass, right? You start with that that massing, and then, then you create space out of that. But I think the way you're describing it is it's actually the, the reverse of that is the, is the way that you see it, which is, that's amazing. Um, so, you know, our audience would, would love to get to know you better, a little bit about it, your, your backstory. Um, can you tell us about, uh, you know, a little bit about growing up, your childhood in, in, in South America? Sure. Yeah. So I grew up in Colombia, South America, not South Carolina. Um, and and <laughs> that's right, there's yeah, Colombia. Yeah. So, South. Yeah, yeah. That's true. so I, I grew up in in Bogota, Colombia. You know, there's a big city with about nine million people, very fast. Um, and I went to architecture school down there. And while I was in architecture school, I was was very impressed looking at you know books and magazines of international architects, seeing these amazing projects. And I think that's where I started thinking about, well, maybe I'd like to go practice architecture somewhere else, not, not in my country. And when I graduated um, from architecture school, the, the economic and political situation in Colombia was not the best. So a lot of unemployment, not a lot of opportunities for young professionals. So I kind of set my mind on, okay, I'm going to leave. Um, I'm just going to save some money. And I did that. I worked for about a year for a small architecture company, doing a lot of AutoCAD work. And finally got to the point where I um, said, you know, let's set the date. And I set the date. My, I have two younger brothers and my youngest brother graduated from high school. So my brother and I came to, to Atlanta with $3,000. That was in um, 2001. Wow. And we went there for a couple, we were there for a couple of weeks because we were visiting two cousins. And then we had a, um, another cousin in Charlotte, North Carolina. The, and we planned to visit that cousin for, for a weekend. So we came for a weekend and we never left. When, when I saw the city and I saw Charlotte and the urban environment, I was so impressed because of the high contrast that I, that I found between Colombia and especially Bogota, that is such a big city. And Charlotte, especially 20 years ago, was so open, clean, mm. a lot of green. And I, I just felt peace. And I was like, oh, my God, I want to stay here. <laughs> <laughs> so so we came with $3,000. We we bought a car for $1,000. We rented an apartment for three months. Bought some groceries and started just walking the streets of South Boulevard, which was a street where we left and, you know, just knocking doors, looking for jobs, you know, anywhere we could. 
So my brother started working in um, find a job in construction. I uh, started working um, cleaning windows for you know new home builders. I will just clean, do the final clean up of windows. I've worked on that for about two, three weeks. And then a friend of mine that I was working with me um, was going to pay for his car insurance. We went to the insurance um, agency and there was a lady there from Venezuela. And she said, hey, I'm working at a restaurant. If you guys want to go, you know, I can talk to the owner maybe. You can get a better job. I'm like, sure. So I went there and yep, I got a job as a bus boy. I had no idea what bus boy was. You know, my English was not very good at that time. So I started working in there, you know, a lot of work, very hard, you know, cleaning, cleaning toilets, mopping the floor, baking bread, doing all these things that I never done before. But I was so happy to do it. You know, I was, I felt that I was making, making a lot of progress. So in the meantime, um, I had to start kind of looking for, okay, how, how am I going to transition to be an architect, which was the end goal that I had in mind since the beginning. And when you come to the country as a tourist, you know, basically you go to immigration and they tell you, okay, you can be in this, in the country for a certain amount of time. So they gave us six months. So you, you can be in the country for six months. If I stay more than that, then I will be out of status. I will have to go back to, to, to Colombia. Mm-hmm. So I pretty much had that six month clock ticking to, to do something. So at that point, when I was about two months into the country, then I started realizing, you know, you know what do I need to do? I, I talked to a lawyer. They explained to me all the process of the working visa, you know, the H-1B, um, you know, how much it was. So I kind of got an understanding, okay, this is what I need to do. So at the restaurant, I went and got the Yellow Pages book and read four pages with architecture firms, put it in my, in my pocket because uh, I didn't have a computer. Wow. So I will just wake up very early on my day off. It was Mondays and I will go through the list and show up at the architecture farms. <laughs> I didn't send a resume because I didn't know. I didn't know how to do it. So we just show up there and people were like, okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. Do you have a resume? I'm like, sure. Yeah, what is that? <laughs> and so I went to a library, made a resume. The good thing is that I had a lot of um, CAD work. You know, I'm always being very passionate, passionate about technology. Sure. So I had been using AutoCAD for many years and I had, I helped professors, you know, while I was school, I will help my professors with their projects. So I had a good amount of work to show that was very helpful, which, you know, it wasn't a problem when you're communicating. If I didn't speak very well English, if, if you understand design and production, mm-hmm. hey, this valuable. guy can draw. Let's yeah. hire him. <laughs> uh-huh. So I went to um, uh, many firms and I went to one medium, medium sized architecture firm here in Charlotte. And one of the, I just walk in there and say, Hey, looking for a job. And then there was a guy and he said, Okay, what do you have? I'm like, This is my portfolio. He said, Okay, let me see. So he looks at it and he's like, Man, I like this. Um, why don't you come in about two weeks for an interview? I talked to my partners and We'll see because we need somebody with your school skill set. So I said, okay, sounds good. That, you know, it was about three months that I had been in the country. Um, then they they interviewed me, you know, and I said, well, yeah, I need a job. But I not only need a job, I need a working visa, which is $3,500, which mm-hmm. I don't have. And I talked to this lawyer and I gave them the business card and said, um, you know, you need to sign all this paperwork and do all these things. So it was the hardest sell of my life, you know, to to, you know, to be able to sell that. Now I, I think back at that time, I'm like, oh my God. Now that I'm thinking about hiring people and I hire people, mm-hmm. what they did, it was amazing because the opportunity they gave me transform my life, my family. I mean, it's exponential value of what they did. And, you know, today I do, I do projects with them, you know, we're, wow. we, we're friends, you know, they're amazing people. So I talk to them and they say, okay, um, why don't we do this? We don't know how to check your references. We don't know much about you. Why don't you come next week and work for one week part-time? We'll see how it goes. And I said, sure. So I showed up and they, they start giving me just cat work. Hey, there's these floor plans, hand-drawn, put it in out of cat. I said, sure. So, you know, that week 
that computer was on fire. I was working like a machine. <laughs> I was like doing things, give me more, more, more. <laughs> so I, I, I'm there for, you know, did the work one week and they say, okay, we're going to meet um, and let you know. And about two weeks later, I got a call from the lawyer that I met with. And, and she said, hey, I just want to tell you that this company call, they pay for your working visa. You start next week. Wow. So that's, that's how everything started. What an opportunity. I mean, it, yeah. look, looking back at that, does it seem surreal that, that A, you 100%. came here with hardly any money, you, you, you just kind of figured it out? I mean, looking back at your young self, would you, could you imagine that you did that? Yes. I mean, I think about that person and I'm like, I cannot believe that person was me. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't believe it. It's so surreal because the other thing was my attitude. I'm, I'm very positive, but even at that time, I was very, in my mind, there was no doubt this thing was going to work. Yeah. So I was never worried. I was never sad. It was always positive. Even when I remember I had to clean toilets in that restaurant. And I will be so happy. Like in my mind, I was like, this is amazing. I'm, I'm very close. I'm very close to my dream. This is going to happen. And I used to go uptown here in Charlotte. And when I was visiting architecture firms and see other people, you know, get out of their offices, go to, go to have lunch, driving these nice cars, dressing very well. And I will think, wow, that's my dream. And, and I felt that I could almost touch it. Mm -hmm. It was so close, but I didn't have it. But it was right there, right there, right there. And and then years later, I'm working there and I'm that person Yeah, that, yeah. I, that I visualize. And I'm like, oh my God, this thing is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> do you, not to get too political, but do you think yeah. that, you know, the born and bred Americans don't realize kind of how good they have it and the opportunity that's right in front of them? 100%. That's people ask me that and was, what do you think, you know, about Americans? And I said, they don't see they, they don't realize what they have. They're millionaires and they don't know it. <laughs> they don't know. They don't know. It's like you're having a million dollar check under your mattress. Yeah. And you don't cash it. Yeah. Yeah. But you already have it. Yeah, it's right there for the taking. It's right there. Yeah. It's right there. People get lazy, unfortunately. And and you with hard work. You know, and showing that showing that company in your week trial, you know, yeah. a week long trial that yeah, yeah, I can do I can do ten times the amount of work, uh, you know, cranking out drawings in in AutoCAD, which is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god! So going going back to to Columbia for a minute, um, mm -hmm. you know, you went to architecture school there. Why is it that you, you know what what is it that sparked you number one to want to be an architect, but then why why did you know what what in your in your mind made you think i have to go to i have to practice architecture in in america not in in my country here i don't know exactly what was that i think it slowly started building out in 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 my own self that idea that i wanted to go somewhere um i know that Part of the part of the problem of a big city, you know, like you know, traffic, um, dirty streets, um, um, insecurity. You know, there were many things that I experienced that I was never happy about. Okay, were were in that context. I was like, man, like man, you always need to lock your car, and and oh, somebody stole this thing, or there is this happening, and all these stories that they were negative, very common you know and you watch the news and it's negative negative and and i never liked that and i and i think i felt that it was my it was one way for me to go away from that just okay. to go to another context where that is not a reality or that is not that intense hmm. um this this is kind of like the first time i'm kind of verbalizing that thanks for your question <laughs> <laughs> I never uh, thought about it, but yeah, I think I was running away from from the tension. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, th I, you know, I you know, I work in New York City, but I live in a very sort of suburban area of of New Jersey. And you know, when I was younger, living in New York City was wonderful. Uh, but having kids and being able to leave New York City, um, it really is. Uh, it, 
it number one, I appreciate the city at that point when I get to when I go. Um, but it is it's it's much more mind relaxing when you do leave and you see open space. And I think what's interesting is COVID has has shown a lot of New Yorkers, tried and true New Yorkers, that you know th- there are people that you know pride themselves on I haven't left New York City in you know 180 days, or I haven't even yeah. you know there are people that I haven't gone above 23rd Street in the last three years. You know it's like stupid stuff like that, but. COVID kind of brought them out. And all of a sudden you're seeing people even in the area that I I live where, oh, you know, this is actually really nice here. I'm, sure. I'm only 45 minutes away from New York City. I can go in, but I have open space. I can relax. I can let my mind be free. And it's a different, uh, it's a different experience. So I, I get what yeah. you're saying. Um, so, so the firm that you worked at that gave you that opportunity, what was their name? Was that McClure? Yeah, McClure Nicholson and Montgomery Architects. Okay. And yeah. then, so you worked there for a few years. You worked at DMR mm-hmm. Architecture, correct? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you worked at Gensler. Yes. Um, so kind of thinking about your experience at these firms uh, over the course of uh, 16 years, I guess is what it was. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what What did they do well? What did they do wrong? And what is it when you now, you know, establish your own firm, you know, those kind of lessons that you you learn both good and bad from those larger organizations? How do you take them and, and, and now establish yourself as your own firm? They did. I think they intentionally did their best, each of those firms. And and I and it was it was a very interesting transition because I think it was just lucky that I went from small firm to medium firm to large firm, so it, it was very gradual. Mm-hmm. So I had I had the experience of all the firms. So at the very first firm, a small company, I had to do pretty much anything. Um, when I joined that firm, uh, about two years later, they went through you know a, a crisis when one of the partners left taking with him a lot of big projects and and he left other three partners mm. and and with the firm got to the point that I was the only person doing production mm. or three partners so i had to do residential multifamily banks high rise adaptive reuse restaurants everything and and in my mind i was there to work so okay i'll do it and i just did the work so i'm like working heads down for 3 years when I, when I finally put my head up, I'm like, oh, my God, I know so much. I didn't know. <laughs> and, and it was just the partners and I. So I had to do from code research, detailing, you know, coordination, engineering, everything except selling. Mm. And, and it was interesting because by uh, 2006, um, well, well, during that time, I got married and I got married to the um, insurance agent that helped us find the job at the restaurant. <laughs> she's, she's from Venezuela. So she's my wife today. She, oh, wow. We've been married 16 years. So, so while I was there, she was like, hey, I think you, 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 know, you, you should look for, an, for a better firm. She, she's always pushing me mm. to go to the next level. Mm. And she was like, man, why don't you try and see if there is something else? I'll say, okay. So I started looking for jobs and, and right away I found multiple opportunities offering me a lot more money than I was making because I didn't realize how, how valuable I was. When I show my portfolio and they're like, did you do these drawings? I'm like, yeah. The whole set? I'm like, yeah. Now, was that <laughs> like, hard because they had given you the opportunity? You know, in a sense, now you're you're cheating on them, right? You're you're searching out something else. Was that hard for you to, to rationalize? Yes, yes, because your your first instinct is to be very thankful yeah. to somebody who gave you the opportunity, right? And and the way you're thankful is just giving them good work, helping them, right? Mm-hmm. And when you don't understand finances, like you don't know how much money are you generating, yeah. right? You you don't know that. And and but it got to the point where when I start feeling that I'm limiting myself and that I'm spinning my wheels, that, that to me is the worst. Like I'm very consistent. I can be consistent for blocks of years, but when I hit a point where I'm not growing, then when, that's when I'm not feeling good about myself. That is when I, I'm, I'm now I put others second. Mm. Now I need to address myself first. And I hit that point. I hit the point where I hit the ceiling. Yeah. And I tried, I mean, I try, I talked to them about, hey, help me to help me to learn how to sell. 
Mm. I want to do marketing money, but they were never engaged in that conversation. It was, okay. oh yeah, sure. Yeah. So many things I had to do on my own, like doing the IDP, joining AIA, understanding how to become a licensed architect here. I had okay. to do that on my own. They never, and I don't think it's by, it was because they didn't want to do it. It was just not in their mind. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. No, no, yeah. no harm to them. And, and that, sure. that model is that sort of partner seller model. That's, that's kind mm-hmm. of how a lot of architecture firms work and they may not even been able to show you how to sell, right. You know, sure. it's a hard thing to say, okay, know. you know, yeah. this is how you do it because everybody yeah. does, especially in architecture, everybody does it differently. Yet it is the key to owning your own business. Ultimately, that's right. In the end. Yeah. So that experience was good because let's, I, I covered the foundation of production. Okay, I can produce a project, you know, show me a a rendering and I'll deliver a permit set, Mm. coordinated. Um, So I've then I found a um, a switch to another company. And at that time, you know, I had to switch working visa and applying for residence. That's that's all parallel to all this process. That Mm -hmm. is just paperwork and money. So I moved to another company that was a larger firm. It's about 40 people doing a lot of mixed use retail, um, national projects, movie theaters. So it was awesome because I started learning and understanding urban planning. Um, you know, we did movie theaters that was very complex acoustics and, and that's where, um, so the first farm we used to work in AutoCAD. This next one was MicroStation. Mm-hmm. And then in about, when I was there for about two years, I transitioned to Revit. Wow. And that was one of the things. I was one of the first persons to introduce Revit to the company that was in 2008. Oh, wow. That was really so, in the Revit yeah. world. Yeah. So I started doing that. You know, it was awesome. Great experience. And then, you know, the downturn happened. Mm. So they started slashing and <laughs> calling meetings, meetings every Monday group groups of three or four when they come back pick up their things and leave mm. like, oh my god you, you're kind of waiting <laughs> yeah, when they're a calling horrible you out. Feeling, yep. yeah so it got to the point where of uh, it took for probably eight months or nine months to where they went through all the laid offs and at the end of the day they kept three people and i was one of them oh wow so three architects three partners you know the farm used to be 40 people Wow. Three architects, three partners. And once they we were there, they said, okay, we're going to keep you guys, but we're going to cut your salaries. <laughs> <laughs> we're like, okay. I mean, at, the, there is, at that point, there was no choice. Yeah. Yeah. I was just thankful to have a job. Like, okay, you know, they cut our salaries. I think it was to 70%. And and my my wife was laid off at that time. She was working uh, at that time. And, you know, I had a period of about a year. It was not a lot of were coming in and that's where I focus on becoming a licensed architect ah. because since my degree is foreign, it's not that easy. You know, to you have to go through those, another yeah. process. You need to validate your degree. So that took me, took me maybe two years to validate my degree, took the test, take the test and become a licensed architect. Hmm. So during that time, that's where, um, you know, I've, it was good because I have, I was able to gain a lot of new experience expanded my my knowledge my understanding portfolio i was getting involved in marketing i was helping with pitches um got a little bit more familiar with that side of the business and then in about 2009 my wife again wanted to push me to the next level she was asking me okay what's the next level what are you gonna do why don't you look for something else i was like there is nobody's hiring unemployment rate is in our in architecture is 75 yeah. percent but she bothered me so much that one day I said, okay, I'm going to apply and I'll show you. And I go Google Gensler. I'm like, okay, I'm going to apply here. <laughs> <laughs> I just applied to keep her happy. And and like a month later, they called me for an, for an interview. I went to the interview and it went great. They offered me the job and I started at Gensler in 2010. Oh, wow. Okay. So yeah, as the recession begins to end, you're, you're yes. starting there. Okay. And so, you know, you're an entrepreneur, you're now the founder of your company, uh, you know, tell me a little bit about, you know, that process that, you know, you're working now at Gensler. Is it your wife again that says, Hey, go out on your own. How does that work? Well, it was interesting because <laughs> I had the dream of having my firm since I came to the United States. 
But when I was, you know, when I finally go through that process of working with their farms, I work in and working at Gensler, which, you know, it's amazing. You have great people, great projects, great pay, travel internationally, having fun, you know, you're getting your bonuses, your races. Mm-hmm. I feel like, oh my God, made it. Stuff you just know, shows American up on your dream. lap and you, you yeah. start working on it. <laughs> American dream check. But I was not, I was not fulfilled. I was uncomfortable. Mm. And, and, and there was a couple of years where it was, I struggled because I felt that I was being ungrateful. I would say, well, I have everything I wanted. Why, why am I not, I'm not happy. This is crazy. So I talked to my wife, to, you know, talk to other friends and everybody's like, well, no, man, you have to do it. You have to do it because, you know, you always have an excuse. You know, I used to say, oh, no, I have one kid. No, I have two kids. No, mm-hmm. I have three kids. No, I need to pay this. No health insurance. It's never always a good time excuse. to do anything if you really never, overanalyze never. it. Yep. And finally, that was December 2016. We went back to Colombia to visit my family. I met, you know, I have a, a lot of architects friends in Colombia. They have their own firms. And, and I start thinking, man, I need to do this. So on our way back to Colombia, we said, okay, I'm going to do it. And my wife said, yep, you have to do it. I believe in you. And that I did it like that. You know, I had no, I didn't have projects lined up or big savings or all these things. Mm-hmm. I didn't have <laughs> something to, to fall back. So how did you get your first client then? So the first thing I did, well, I came back from, from vacation. I, I resigned that day. So I worked for about three more weeks. <laughs> and then I bought a computer. This one I'm using here to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> and and then I started, okay, I'm like, okay, I need to have some money t- just in case. Um, and I, my wife found a loan online, a uh, personal loan in SoFi.com. We oh, got yeah. like $60,000, like at 15%. <laughs> We're like, okay, just in case. <laughs> And and then it started just once I once I it was my last day, then I started calling people, emailing everybody I knew and touched before. Um and the amazing thing is when I started realizing that I had been working for my own firm even twelve years before. Yeah. Every every engineer I talked to, every client I talked to, everybody I I had contact with. I, and I realized, wow, I've been doing business development for for my own business and I didn't know it <laughs> because everybody was very excited. They're like, wow, that's amazing. I, I love it. How can I help you? Everybody, how can I help you? How can I help you? So if it might be somebody could refer me to a project, somebody may have something. So my first project, it was actually for another architect that I met through the AIA um because i used to do tours of the projects i was project architect i will do tours for other firms and i i met architects and other firms so it was a residential architect i still work with him oh, wow. and he's he's very successful doing very nice high-end residential and he said hey I, I'm, I'm overloaded if you want to help me with projects and i said sure so i did the most coordinated and beautiful residential <laughs> sets you have ever seen in your life <laughs> And I started like that, you know, a small residential, you know, additions here and there, and then started gaining traction on more commercial, focusing on, you know, my network. It's ma- mainly through, you know, third-party companies like, you know, JLL, CBRE, Cushman Whitefield. So I started networking, you know, I kind of mm-hmm. knew where things are and then started getting projects um like that. And once those guys trust you and they know you're going to do a good job for them by their client. And as you said, from the very beginning, you know, it's the client's project. It's not your project. Yeah. And you treat it that way. That work now can begin to flow into you. And so, so how, you know, today, how, how large is your firm? What kind of projects are you working on? Yeah. So today we are four people. Um, one of the, one of the things that I'm focusing on this year, it's, so I feel like the first four years have been about, you know, proving to the marketplace that, you know, I'm real, the firm is real, we're doing real projects. And, and now I'm going through a phase where it's becoming more, stra- be more strategic with the business plan. Okay. So understanding growth, finances, how, to, you know, how, where to focus. So what we are today is we do 99% commercial architecture. Within that 99%, I would say 
80, 70 percent is in office and workplace projects. Mm -hmm. We have uh, adaptive reuse. And with the client mix, we work with, you know, the third party project managers sure. uh, and users. And we also do a lot of work for Mecklenburg, Mecklenburg County here in Charlotte, so government agency. Hmm. And we do a lot of on-call services for them. Great. And those type of projects are mainly renovations, uh, a lot of complex engineering projects that, you know, as architects, we lead, we lead that, that process. And we also do a lot of brand design work within the design, construction, or real estate industry, where we help companies clarify what's the unique differentiator they bring to the marketplace. And this, once you clarify the message, we help them put a face to it. And those become uh, brand design projects like brand identity, web design, social media strategies, brochure, things like that. That's great. Yeah. So you encompass the whole package there to deliver not only the physical space, but also their brand as yep. you go. And so, you know, in, when you mentioned workplace, has COVID affected your the workplace in, in Charlotte? Yes. Uh, I had some projects that were uh, either canceled or delayed, okay. uh, mainly because people just to stay at home. So the client said, well, I don't really need to spend this money right now because we're doing fine <laughs> remote, which makes a lot of sense. Sure. So, you know, a lot of those things that happened um, 24, 18 months ago now are coming back because, you know, people are coming back to the office. So I'm seeing a, a, an uptick in project requests in the last, you know, two, three months. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the overall uh, disruption of working from home is going to make changes in the, in the workplace design? I don't, I don't think it's going to make too many changes. Like if COVID didn't happen, mm -hmm. it will probably be in the same direction. Like okay. if we look at 10 years down the road, we're not going to say, oh, my God, COVID transformed the workplace. Right. I don't think so. Um, I think the, the biggest transformation is generational. So the, the newer generation going to workplace, now they're used to to a very different, more, um, you know, residential hospitality lifestyle type sure. of feeling. Sure. And you expect that, you know, before that. We just wanted a, a cubicle and you're fine to be there. But now they, they don't expect it. So, but I think that's more generational. Mm -hmm. And also the, I will, I will think the biggest impact will be that, you know, companies, corporations, you know, employers in general, they, they all going to have some type of flexible, you know, Policies. work option. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So you can say, okay, you, you know, you can be at home these many days and you could have like a menu of options. You want to do A, B or C. Yep. So, at least you have a choice. It's not going to be just one option and you have to do that. You could, but you're not going to be competitive in the workplace world. That's what's exactly. going to happen. I, I, I would agree with that 100%. I think the physical space is probably not going to change all that much, um, but the policies around it will. So, right. um, so I remember about six or seven years ago, uh, we had hired a business coach and a uh, very effective uh, person. And, you know, he kind of helped us uh, align business plans and, um, you know, redo the way we were reporting our finances. And there was a lot of sort of technical things and then a lot of aspirational things in terms of a business plan that we came up with. And one of the things that he was all over me about was thought leadership. You need to be in front of everybody with thought leadership. And, and his thing was, well, you should be writing articles. You should be doing speaking engagements. And, and I remember I sat down to like write an article. And I, I can't write. I, I can talk. Yeah. Um, I, I could do the. I could do go and and be on a panel discussion. That stuff I loved. Um, but. You know, when when my my crew here kind of pushed me to do my own podcast, that's where I really realized, oh, this is thought leadership as well, and this is something I can actually do and enjoy, and I love having the guests and researching, and 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 it's a fun conversation. So, you know, what inspired you to 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 start your podcast? At the beginning, it was just the um. The idea of doing something that I enjoy because I enjoy listening to podcasts. You know, I started listening to podcasts maybe 
10 years ago and 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 I love it I love it you know I used to uh, you know I need I, I I make sure that I get at least one or two hours of listening to podcasts a day and and after doing it for like five six years you realize the the compound effect of new information along the years is amazing um, because I learned I learn a lot about branding, marketing, you know, sales, leadership, things that I'm interested about, but I never, you know, actually went to school for that. And I realized when I started having conversations and I kind of saying things that were like, oh my God, where that came from. So it really builds me up to be to be a better person and to focus on what I'm interested about. Mm-hmm. So so that I was the first I the first thought of like, oh no, I need I need to do this. And at the same time, I when I started the business, the first year and a half, you know, I, I started getting through this cycle of, you know, ups and downs because I will go sell the projects. When I get the projects, since I'm doer seller, I'm executing, mm-hmm. then I finish and I have no work. So it was this up and down. So I thought, well, maybe to be top of mind and, and be out there with me, my prospects, I, you know, I can do it just doing a podcast. They see it. They know who I am. So it was a business strategy. Yeah. And once I had those two things, then it was the biggest, the biggest step, which is I was scared because I was number one, I was very self-conscious about my accent. And I was like, nobody's going to listen to this accent. They don't understand what I'm saying. <laughs> and two, you know, I'm an, I'm an introvert. I'm not the life of the party and kind of, you know, on my own head most of the time, I was just scared, just like that, sure. scared and people judging me <laughs> and people not liking it. Mm-hmm. So, um, we know the, the, the combination of those three things was like, okay, these, these are all the reasons why I should do it. Yeah. To improve I, my business, to learn more and to take a step being scared of doing it. So, uh, I did it. I put together a plan, a basic plan, you know, the power of design, intersection of construction, architecture and real estate. And I want to inspire people to pursue their full potential. Yeah, um, I develop a target audience and then started researching, you know, how do how do you do it? You know, Google found somebody local here who had done podcasts before a producer. I pay him. He sets me up. Yep. And and like three months later, I had my first episode. That's amazing. Congratulations. Yeah. That's awesome. And it's and it's grown. I mean, it, you have quite the following and uh, and a lot of episodes out there. And I and you, I mean, you're an inspiration for me to, uh, you know, to keep going. And, and your your content is is, you know, really thought provoking. And I think you come at it from a different perspective, which I which I really, really appreciate it. And, you know, it kind of all fits your narrative, right? You 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 know, you, you've gone for things where you're weren't comfortable doing them. You took a risk and in the end, the risk paid off. I mean, and, and you, you've only just begun. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's very, very impressive. So yeah, you uh, know, it's, it's interesting because starting my own business, I feel that it has been the same situation as coming as an immigrant the first time, you know, doing something new, not knowing how to do it, trusting yourself, you know, pushing through, uh, letting other people know, you know, being accepted, mm-hmm. um, you know, selling yourself. I feel like I'm going through the fir- the same cycle all over again. But you know what? I mean, in the end, I think you, you, you start to realize this as you go. A lot of people don't really know what they're doing either when they start businesses or they start yeah. a new venture. And, and from the outside looking in, it always looks like, oh, that person is super polished or that person is this. And, and you realize, you know, wait a minute, actually, they probably didn't know that oh, and no. they just took a risk and they were kind of winging it in the beginning, yeah. you know, and, and you figure it out, you know, just sure. like anything else, but you do it in your own way with your own voice and your own yep. personality. And so I wouldn't know that you're an introvert, you know, I wouldn't know that you're not the life of the party, you know, I, I only <laughs> yeah. know you from listening to you, right? So it's uh, it's funny how your own perspective uh, is, yeah. is different from what others perceive, so... You mentioned technology earlier. Um, you know, what opportunities do you see for technology to help architects and and the process? Well, I think we're just at the beginning of understanding BIM. Hmm. Um, I think you know, once you are once you are a, a BIM user, and you know, specifically Revit, because that's what we use here. The the depth is so profound that 
if if you if you understand 10 20 percent you can be proficient mm. and you you produce a set of drawings kind of decent but i think we're missing a lot of efficiencies within the capabilities of the software and most of that is because i don't think it beam is about the technology beam is about the people it's about you need a specific type of brain to really take advantage of beam and it's a brain that that is willing to sit down for 45 minutes reading an article about how the tool works or how the parameters are connected, going through some trials mm -hmm. two hours later to really implement that new thinking into your workflow. Sure. That's, that's huge. So I think just the, the way we embrace the technology has not evolved yet to the point to where the technology is. Mm. Interesting. Um, yeah. I, th I think that's one thing, you know, get into on it might be like a curriculum or a workflow that you, you kind of walk people through it that is not the traditional way of just going to the project and figure out on your own. That's fine, but there are many other ways that you could multiply the efficiency of that effort. Yeah, and you and I had talked about this at one point. I mean, it's this, the, the beauty of the BIM model, right, is that you're, you're inputting all of this information and that information is now contained. But I think the way that we as the business owners or the client we look at it in the end as just a set of drawings. Um, and so we almost set ourselves up because the end result is essentially the same thing that we've always produced over and over again. But we never yep. really come back around and think, well, what exactly are we trying to put in that model? How can we communicate those details or those all those aspects of that model differently rather than printing them out as drawings. Yeah. Um, but until the construction side embraces it and the you know building departments embrace it, you're always going to be taking that extraordinary amount of information that you've put into a, a 3D model and flattening it out and printing it out on a giant piece of paper, which is just so disheartening in the end. I know, I know. <laughs> and and we, you know, we go through all that effort that in my mind. If we're creating a PDF with black lines, why don't you do it in AutoCAD if it's going to take you the same time? Like, why BIM? I'm, I'm always thinking about, unless I'm doing something extremely faster or a lot more coordinated or there is all this huge benefit in BIM, there is no reason to do it. Yeah. And 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 again, you know, as you mentioned, is understanding our role within the project. We can go just so far, but mm -hmm. then what about the contractor? What about the owner? What about facilities management? They're also part of this space we're creating and, and it's 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 a relay race. We need to pass that button to somebody. They need to use it. They need to make it better because that's where sometimes we give too much credit to <laughs> to what we do, but we're just responsible for one part of yeah. what is what it takes to create that built environment. Absolutely. Um, so, a uh, couple other questions here. The uh, you me I mentioned earlier in your intro that you're a musician. You play the drums, correct? I, I do. do I don't still? consider myself a musician, <laughs> but I do play the drums. So yeah. I, I see you post about that every now and then. You're playing the drums, yeah. and do you still play? Yeah, um, I I had a rock band when I was from, probably from 16 to 21 years old. Okay. I play I play in a rock band in Colombia. And you know, with those friends I made with that band, we're still friends. So the people I play with in those videos today are my friends for 30 years. Oh wow. Yeah, so it's amazing. So yeah, I do have a drum set. I had it in my garage, I actually put it back up together this weekend. My kids are so happy and you know, it's so loud. <laughs> but but I like it, man. I know how to do it. And, you know, I'm not this great drummer but i love it and i enjoy it you know i, I have a, a good relationship with music you know i stick to to some bands or style of music you know i grow i get to you know learn about enjoying new styles and it's you know it's a big part of my my life awesome awesome so so kind of bringing it all back around um if you had to do it differently as far as your career is concerned what what might you have changed thus far and again you're you're just you're still starting as the way i see yeah. it. it's kind of like me so well one of the things i say to myself but i'm not sure it's man i should have started my own business sooner mm. right because you start a business and it's like a baby it's gonna grow at their own rate and the sooner the better but at the other side 
if I didn't have the experience, all the experiences I had, you know, I wouldn't be doing things the way I do in it. Sure. So, sure. you know, I, I don't think I would have done anything different. Yeah, that's awesome. Yep. That's awesome. So, well, Jack, thank you so much for for being a guest here on the Anti Architect podcast. Um, so, you know, there's obviously a lot more we could probably talk for hours and hours here. Um, you are an extraordinary inspiration. I, I hope you know that. Um, I'm I'm so excited to put this episode out and to get your. Um, you know, get, get people to hear more about your story, which is, which is just amazing. Um, you know, I hope one day, you know, you and I can collaborate together as well. So, sure. um, to, so I'm going to give you a couple little plugs here, make sure I get them right, uh, to, to see and read more about Jack Osa and his firm, Osa Studio, um, visit their website at, uh, osastudio.com o-s-s-a studio.com and then jack's instagram uh jack underscore osa and then at underscore or osa underscore studio um for the firm and then of course the power of design podcast um follow him on instagram at the power design podcast and then you can obviously listen on uh, youtube apple spotify amazon and where all podcasts are available so thank Sounds you again, good, man. man. I, I really appreciate you you taking the time to be here. Thank you so much, man. I really appreciate you inviting me. And you're, you're also an inspiration to me. When I see what you guys are doing, I'm like, oh, my God, that's amazing. I want to do that. <laughs> you guys do great work. And, uh, yeah, I look forward to, to stay in touch. And maybe one day, if we don't work together, at least sit down and have a have a drink. Sounds good to me. Awesome. Sounds good. Thank you again. <laughs>